So as we continue our series, The Chase, my question for you is, do you think that that thing is ever going to get off that wheel? (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) Uh, The 2000 film uh, titled Miss Congeniality uh, begins and opens with a scene of the protagonist, whose name is Gracie Hart, in her elementary days on the preschool, on the, on the, on the, play, on the playground in preschool. And uh, she sees over across the yard, two boys get in, into a fight where one is clearly dominating the other. And she nonchalantly makes her way over to the monkey bar. She places her arms on the bars and she, as she looks at the fight ensuing and she says this, problem, gentlemen, the bully suspends his beat down and, and sticks out his face at Gracie. If you weren't a girl, I'd beat your face off, he says. To which Gracie responds, if you weren't a girl, I'd beat your face off. <laughs> the bully lunges at Gracie in response, his fist missing her face and hitting the pole instead. And then Gracie plants her fist firmly on the bully's face in return, just as the bell rings, leaving her and the victim all by themselves. Uh, She says to the boy who was attacked, forget those boys. They're jealous because you're smart and funny. Girls, they like that. And the boy looks up at her and he says, what girls? As he gathers himself and goes into the classroom, and she says in a moment, in a big confession, in a moment of vulnerability, she says, lots of girls like, like me. Upon which the boy responds, now everyone thinks I need a girl to fight me. You are a dork brain. And once again, Gracie plants her fist firmly <laughs> on another boy's face. The movie proceeds to uh, explore Gracie Hart's adult years as she develops into an awkward, frizzy-haired, big glasses, Sandra Bullock playing FBI agent who's trying to find acceptance in the world. And what's true about it and what we're rooting for Gracie about is, what we're rooting for for her is the chance for her to find acceptance in a world that doesn't accept her that much. Uh, these kind of films, they, they, they have a name. They are called the makeover movies. And you might be familiar with some of them, like this one, or The Princess Diaries, or She's All That. If you're a girl, you've probably seen one of them. If you're a guy, you, you probably don't want to admit to having seen any of them. <laughs> but the truth is, despite some of the criticism that these kind of movies have received lately, there's still something true that rings with all of us. We... We all desire to be accepted, and we all hope to find a way that might change something about ourselves or change something about our circumstances so that we can receive the acceptance that we so deeply long for. Some of the ways that we go about this is the makeover. Some of us us rely on being funny. We try to be funny in order that people might like us. And what's especially seemingly true in New England is many of us rely on achievement and ambition in order to be accepted in this world. But the truth is, sooner or later, these all break down and they all fail. They don't achieve the acceptance that we so dearly long for. So the question that I want to explore today is how can we find acceptance, the acceptance that we so deeply long for, and I want to focus especially on that, that pursuit of achievement that we, that we here in New England seem to be especially prone to as we develop that a little bit further. Here in New England, we have the best stuff. We, we have the best colleges. We have some of the best all-around education. When you get to know about the environments and the towns here in southern New Hampshire, you quickly learn the towns take a lot of pride in how great their high schools are. Even at an early age in preschool, parents are already asking their preschool teachers, when are my kids gonna learn math? When are my kids gonna learn science? My seventh month old, I think she's she's probably already supposed to be reading by now because of the pressures and, and the expectations of a high education in this environment. But that's not the only thing that we're proud of and that we find successful. We, we love our sports here, and our sports are great. 
The Boston Celtics have a long history of greatness. The Red Sox are the fifth winningest team when you look at wins and losses of all time. And the Patriots, they're pretty good too, although, you know, if you go back a little ways, that's not so much the case. Personally, we strive. We have great ambitions and desire to achieve as well. Right here, and many of you have, are really close to achieving all 48 of those 4,000 foot mountains in your hiking travels. Others of you here have attempted or are trying to run for political office because of the achievement that comes with that. You know, in our American culture, it's, it's funny, but meditation has even become a competitive activity. Meditation, <laughs> of all things, has become something that we are competitive about. And, and all of these things are, can be good things. All these achievements can be healthy and they can be fine, but when we pursue them for acceptance, when we pursue them for affection from other people, ultimately, they don't work. Ultimately, they're just going to fail us. A few reasons why. First, they're hollow. We might try to achieve something, but ultimately, ultimately that achievement isn't going to bring with it, it might bring, it might bring with it acceptance from an outside perspective, but those people don't really know us and accept us for who we are. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about suicides of high-profile figures within the media. High-profile figures who have seemed very successful on the surface, like, like Chef Anthony Bourdain, who had Emmys to his name, a popular television show, and tons and tons of Twitter followers. He had every sign of achievement, but still, at the end of the day, there was something missing from his life. Achievement as a, as a pathway to find acceptance is empty. It, it's hollow. And secondly, when we pursue achievements as a pathway to acceptance, we find that they are ultimately short-lived. You might be the best person at what you do in your community, but there's always the potential that somebody will move in and be better at you than what you do. Or maybe, maybe there's a Maybe there's a trade that, that you're particularly good at that's becoming irrelevant. Let's pretend, for instance, that you were the employee of the month for six months straight at your local Blockbuster video store. <laughs> I have bad news for you. <laughs> Just this week in Alaska, the last two stores in Alaska, the last two Blockbuster stores were closed. There is only one left, that's your store in Bend, Oregon. And that's gonna probably close too. Let's, you know, hope and pray that it, it doesn't. Thirdly, when we pursue achievement as a, as a pathway to be accepted, uh, it doesn't work because it's counterproductive. Ultimately, that the acceptance that you gain from your community is often an acceptance and an appreciation that, that results in envy and results in people just wanting to take your place. Pursuing achievements as a pathway to acceptance, it doesn't work because ultimately people just want your position. They want your place. You know, the sad thing about this is it gets into church culture. It gets into the, the ways that we assemble on a Sunday morning because it's so tempting to make this about personality or about celebrity. This spot right here can be really dangerous. Or that spot right there where people are visible and you can see them and it becomes about celebrity and status and being seen. It's, it's easy for Satan to get into those areas and really exploit the church and lead the church in a wrong direction. And Jesus wasn't unfamiliar with it himself. The religious leaders of the day, they, they love to do things in public so that they might be seen and they might be loved by the people. But he called them hypocrites. The sad thing is that a lot of churches are falling because of it. Uh, this kind of celebrity mentality results in abusive leadership around the country. We, we saw it at Mars Hill in, in Seattle. And, and sometimes it's bubbling underneath the surface of a lot of churches that we're not even aware about because it becomes all about the personality, it becomes all about the achievement, and ultimately people get used and people that get abused. So, I wasn't really sure that I should preach this sermon and I didn't decide to do it until Sunday, for sure, last Sunday, because 
because of my own personal struggle, the own personal struggle that I've had with achievement, especially before I came to know Jesus, I really struggled with acceptance and, and achievement was, was the tool that I was going to use to, to prove people wrong or to earn acceptance among my peers. And when I was very young, I achieved some success and became known. Um, but I didn't want to preach that because it can be a dangerous top topic to even talk about yourself or glorify yourself. But one thing that did come out of that experience was a, was a negative influence that I had on another young man. And I, want to, I don't want to focus on my experience other than to share that I too struggled with this as well. And probably deep down sometimes I still struggle with this. But I want to share with you in a few moments of how I influenced a young man in his pursuit of achievement, but not for good. Ultimately, not for, not for good. So how do we address this a problem of achievement culture? Uh, in the face of achievement culture, God first invi he invites us to do two things. And the first thing that he invites us to do is to live simply. Is to live simply. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, I invite you to open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, verses 11 through 12, which we also have posted up front. The Apostle Paul says this, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and busy yourself with your own things and, and work with your hands, just as we told you, in order that you might live well before outsiders and not depend on anyone. That's, by the way, the reason I like to use a lot of gestures. It'll work with your hands, right? <laughs> Paul is inviting us to have a positive impact on outsiders and not depend on anyone. And he does it in three ways, by giving us three separate ambitions. First, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Make it your ambition to busy yourself with your own things and make it your ambition to work with your hands. Let's take those one at a time. First of all, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. That sounds a little bit strange. Uh, what does that mean? You're supposed to whisper all the time? No, it's, we're not supposed to take that literally. When we look at that word and how it's used in other places in the scripture, sometimes it's used to invoke rest, like on the Sabbath. But that doesn't seem to fit here, especially because of the, the exhortation to uh, to work with your hands. Uh, some of you might have adult children living at home that would love to take this verse and say, see, I'm just supposed to live a quiet and simple life uh, who aren't working or contributing in your home. But no, not at all. That's not what it's about. Uh, the second way that we can take this is, uh, is an expression of living peaceably. We can do that because that word is used in another context where Paul invites people to live a quiet and peaceable life. And that would make good sense here. But I think the best answer, what this means to live a quiet life, can be found in an expression in 1 Peter, where, where Peter exhorts his listeners to live a meek and quiet life, or a humble and quiet life. One that doesn't pursue achievement for attention. One that doesn't seek the acceptance of other people. So what does it mean to live a quiet life? It means to live a life that doesn't pursue the acceptance of other, doesn't pursue, pursue achievement for the acceptance of other people. Paul is going to help clarify that a little bit by the next two ambitions that he gives us. His second one is to make it your ambition to busy yourself, yourself <clears throat> with your own things. Some of your translations might render this as mind your own business. And what this is doing is it's encouraging us to avoid the comparison trap that we all fall into. You know, we might be satisfied with our achievement, but when we start looking at the achievement of, of such and such a person, then there's something within us that starts to burn and something within us that, 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 that desire for achievement is a way to 
be accepted within our community, to be perceived as greater than our companions and our friends, it starts to fuel and it starts to get greater. So that's the first danger that we need to avoid. We need to avoid the comparison trap. Mind and think about your own things. The third ambition that that Paul gives us is to work with your hands, which probably puts a lot of us in a really tough position, right? (laughs) Now, Jesus was a carpenter. Most of his apostles were fishermen. They, they did things with their hands. So how are we supposed to live this out in the 20th century? Are accountants all of a sudden supposed to quit their jobs and become construction workers? Uh, I don't think so. I think that this was an expression for earn an honest living. In Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses, verse 28 Uh, Paul uses the same expression there, work with your own hands. And and he he explains that as as not stealing. Uh, Don't steal from people, but work with your own hands. So this is another way of saying, likely, earn an honest living. And that was a real problem back then because of professions like tax collectors who just went door to door collecting taxes for the Roman government and would take a cut for themselves, sometimes a really generous cut for themselves, and weren't perceived very well by the people during that time. The truth is that Christians today struggle with the same thing, because there are professions out there that we ought to avoid altogether. There are loan sharks who take advantage of people in really bad situations, and I've known of Christians who have been in these professions. There are people who get involved with pyramid schemes that benefit the people on the top and and harm and abuse the people on the bottom. It's easy to get involved and to start to, it's easy to get involved in those lies and those traps, but they end up abusing people and taking advantage of people. And what Paul is encouraging us to do is work, but do honest work. Do honest work on your pathway to live a simple life in order to avoid this, this trap of desiring the, the, the acceptance of other people. Uh, chances are, uh, chances are that there are a lot of high achieving people out here. Uh, chances are there are people in high achieving jobs, uh, or, or even that there's there's an opportunity on the horizon horizon that's a that's a position that might that might boost you to the next level. Uh, I don't want you to think that God says that's bad. Certainly in the Old Testament there were all sorts of God's children who were, who were appointed to high positions. You had Nehemiah, who was, who was a cupbearer before the king. You had, you had Joseph, who, who high, was a high-ranking official underneath Pharaoh. And you had King David. I mean, you don't get much higher than that, right? You had all the kings of Israel. I don't want you to think that position and status is not bad and that God doesn't often appoint us to positions and places like that. But if you are pursuing achievement as a pathway to acceptance, I want to encourage you to reconsider. I want to encourage you to reconsider. Sometimes we think that God can only use us if we obtain some sort of celebrity and some sort of status. And chances are, if you think that way, God can't use you at all. There's so much more to life than achievement and status for acceptance. Uh, You may find yourself with a whole lot of achievements, but not much else. When I was in high school, as a senior in high school getting ready to graduate, I saw a a young boy sitting out in in this open foyer all by himself. It was the school day had ended and the hallway lights were, were dim and he was just sitting there by himself and so I went up to him, and I started a conversation. I, I learned that he was on the wrestling team, but an injury had sidelined him for the year. So I was involved in something called extemporaneous, extemporaneous speaking at the time, and I thought, well, hey, why don't you, it doesn't look like you're wrestling, why don't you come and try this instead? So I, I brought him on board, and I gave him a topic, and he prepared a speech in about an hour, and he performed it, and, and uh, I thought, wow, he, this guy did a pretty good job for a freshman. So I took him under my wing and uh, developed a friendship with him and kind of became a little bit of a coach, pouring out my desire and passion for achievement into his life. 
I later learned after I had left that he had often felt like from other teachers that he was living underneath my shadow, that people would compare him to me and to the things that I had done, and that made, made him just feel suppressed and like he always had to perform better to, to, to be freed from the standard that I set for him. He ended up coming to the same college that I went to, and he continued his path of, uh, and his pursuit of achievement. But I had found something different in Jesus, and I had learned a hard lesson that the achievements that I was running after were empty. And I, I ended up burying them one by one. And I was really concerned about the standard that I had left for people before me. So I remember taking my friend to the top of a hill one day and just talking to him about Jesus and talking to him about how much more meaningful Jesus was and some of the accomplishments that, that I, had, I had attained to or some of the accomplishments that he was pursuing as well. And it seemed like he took to it, but I wasn't quite sure. And it, as time passed, uh, my doubts increased. I remember the last time that I sat down with him. It was uh, over a meal at a restaurant and we sat only about two feet from each other but it felt like we were, we were sitting miles apart. My friend had just achieved the, the highest position in the university. He had ran for student government, became president. He was one of three people in the entire state that had a seat on the board that influenced the entire university system. And I said to him, you finally did it. You finally, you finally beat me. Without any jealousy at all, you finally you finally found your place from outside of my shadow. And he nodded, and we continued our conversation. But, but I grieved so much after that because, because I gave him something that wasn't going to last. And, and I couldn't give him the one thing that could. But that can be different for you, and that can be different for me. God, in the face of our achievement culture here in New England, God invites us to live a simple life. But that really doesn't answer our need, the deep need that we have for acceptance. So God invites us to do one more thing. He invites us to find our acceptance in him. To find our acceptance in him. So the Apostle Paul gives us a new ambition in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, where he says this. So whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it, we make it our ambition to please him. Let me say that again. So whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it, we make it our ambition to please him. When we become single-minded about pleasing God, our need to be accepted by people will be fully met by the promise that God will accept us. You know what's funny about this? When we think about that previous text, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, Paul was encouraging a simple life so that, so that people might be well-respected by outsiders. When we, are, when we single-mindedly and are singly focused on pleasing God, ironically what happens is we often end up having a good reputation with other people as well. And, and as I think about that, and as maybe you think about that too, there's good reason for that because when you're leading a simple life that's not trying to climb over people and is not so eager for achievements that you forget about the people next to you, uh, they aren't threatened. When they see you working hard, they respect you. They say, you know what, that, that person, that's a person that I think that I could probably hang around. Or that's a person that, that I might like to get to know. But the challenge of this is that it requires great faith to do it. It requires a lot of faith. Because for us, it's, it's easy to please people. Uh, we can't, we can't do things to please our spouses anymore. We can't do things to just please our, our, our bosses anymore. We can't do things just to please our peers. We can't do things to please just to please our pastor 
We can't do things just to please our churches anymore. Now, your pastor might end up being really pleased, and that's, that's a great thing, <laughs> or your spouse, or whatever. But that wasn't the goal in the first place. The ambition, the single focus, was always to please God. A couple weeks ago, we, we, we threw a party for people who, in the congregation who are regularly committed to serving on, on a regular basis. It was a great time. The last year, we called it our volunteer barbecue. But after taking that word into consideration, we decided to jettison it. Get rid of that word volunteer because what people are doing here is not volunteering. They're not volunteering. They're not volunteering for some charity or organization. They're not doing good deeds for some nebulous entity. When people serve here, they don't serve the pastor, they don't serve the elders, they serve God. So whether whether you are Jim, who serves on the finance team, whether you are Jim, who serves on our coffee team, whether you are Jim, who runs our plow crew, or whether you are Jim, <laughs> who repaired some of our bare wood last week, no matter which Jim you are here, <laughs> you're not serving an organization. You are serving God. You're serving God. It's hard, and it's a, it, the reason that this requires a lot of faith for us, because we, we look at the people. We look at the building. We look at the money. And we make our decisions based upon them instead of the only one who really matters in this whole thing to begin with. And when we make it our aim to please him, people will be loved, people will be cherished, and all good things will happen happen in between. It's, it's not just true, though, of church life. It's true of your everyday life as well. There are a lot of people that might say, hey, you know what? My goal in life is to make my wife happy. My goal in life is to make my, my husband happy. It's, it's, it's all about other people. But when you say that it's all about other people, the tricky thing is, is it's really about you. As hard as that is to say, if God is not your single priority, if God is not the focus, if God is not the one that you want to please, serving anybody else is, is really just about serving you and your interests. God frees us from that. In the face of achievement culture, God invites us to live a simple life and find our acceptance in him. There is no greater acceptance than being celebrated and welcomed by the king. There's no greater reward than his pleasure in us. And there is no accolade that can compare to all of it. So my question for you is what's your next aim? What's, what's that thing that's, that maybe, that's maybe bouncing around in your head, that, that opportunity for you to potentially achieve some acceptance in your life. Maybe you feel neglected at work. Maybe you feel neglected in your family and you're just waiting for that door to open up so that you can take that position, you can make that achievement so that you'll finally earn the respect that you believe that you deserve. But the truth is, just because there is an open door doesn't mean God is the one who is opening it. Because there's an open door doesn't mean that God is the one who is opening it. And I want you to consider maybe something different happens. And you ask yourself the question, am I really doing this to please my heavenly father? Or am I doing this? Am I doing this to please myself? And if, it's, if the answer is the second one, I encourage you and I invite you, I invite you to run from it. Because the only answer to our achievement culture is really God's invitation to live a simple life and find our acceptance in him. The acceptance that comes from God is unmatched. A lifestyle that pleases him may look simple on the outside, but eyes of faith will see that it is really something too wonderful for words. Let's pray. 
God, there is something within us that when we are honest, sometimes, sometimes we do things in order to, to please people and earn our acceptance from a source that's other than you. We ask God during this moment that, that, that can be really difficult for us that you would graciously show us those areas in our lives where we, where we are serving people and we are finding our pleasure outside of you. And you would graciously and kind of, kindly invite us, Lord, into a better experience, into a better hope of knowing you, experiencing your pleasure, and, and, and knowing, God, that not only do you accept us because of your grace, but you will, at the end, accept us because of the choices that we chose to make every day. In Jesus' name, amen.